All right, so starting at the front, we have our first challenge, and this is very, very common for a typical travel trailer. What we've got is one battery out front, outside. So unlike your typical motorhome, there's no battery bay in the middle. And unlike your typical van, you can't decide where you want to put your batteries. You can move these batteries. Uh, the problem is that if you move them off your tongue, a fair bit of your tongue weight is coming from that battery in the propane tanks out here. So if you move that battery back, you're taking a lot of tongue weight and moving it back and you don't want to do that. That's really not ideal. So whenever you can, if you've got your batteries up front, you kind of want to deal with it and you want to be able to work with them. Now. One of the advantages we have in our travel trailer here is that we do have room for a second battery. You can see that this is a Group 27 battery box. It is actually only a Group 24 battery inside. The latch is a little tough for me to get open for the video, but there's a Group 24 battery in here. So I think it's rated for 100 amp hours. God only knows what it's got now. This thing is used. And you can see there is room in the tray over here for a second battery. So I have a dual battery box that I've just ordered, Camco made makes one, and I'm going to be putting two Group 24 batteries in that box, uh, basically doubling my battery capacity. Actually, maybe closer to tripling it. And the reason for that is that this battery is fairly old, so I'm sure it's lost some of its capacity. And then what we've got here is six gauge wire that runs down through this harness here and up into the camper. And you can see where it enters in here. There's a little bit of a junction box, and all of the wiring for the camper is going to enter from that junction box and up into the camper from here. And that means we probably will not be wiring our solar directly to the battery, which is what you see in basically every diagram out there. Wire your solar directly to the battery. Well, it doesn't actually matter where you wire it to. As long as you're putting higher than the battery's voltage somewhere on the bus, uh, electricity will flow into the battery instead of out of it, and your battery will charge. The reason you usually want to wire directly to the battery is it's much more efficient. And what that means is that you've got the shortest run, you're getting the highest amperage you can with the least resistive loss from that wire into the battery. But if you look at the front of this camper, you can see we've got a great big fiberglass shell. You are not running a cable down the front of this thing anywhere. Even if you wanted to try to find a wire, wiring channel somewhere down, along down the side, something like that, it's not really ideal. And so what we're going to do is come down, the solar panels will be up on the back of the travel trailer here, and then I, I can't really show it here on the video, I'm going to do a little bit of a drone stitch in here in a bit, but you can see we've got an AC and a whole bunch of antennas and all sorts of other garbage up on the roof there, but there's plenty of free space for solar panels, and I'll be putting some, flex, uh, excuse me, some flexible solar panels up on the roof. And when I do, they'll be in the back, about as far from the battery as you can get. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the wires for those solar panels to a charger as close to midships as I can. And the reason for that is the place where the batteries normally get charged is back here anyway. This is called a DC converter. And what it does normally is take shore power, which comes in through a hatch down the back of this channel, right, right behind this cupboard. There's a little hatch to the outside world, and there's a cable in there, a 30 amp, 120 volt cable. And that's wired into the back of this. And what this is, very typical setup for a standard travel trailer. This is our converter. So we've got a little bit of a 120 volt side. We've got a 12 volt side. And then... Down in here in the bottom, there is a big transformer and, and um, regulator array that is responsible for charging the battery. So this thing is already charging the battery through a wire run under the floor all the way up to the front. So if we put our voltage out from our solar charge controller into the same spot, onto the same bus, if we put it out there, we know the wire... The cabling is already up to snuff for this. Now, it's only 6 gauge. Uh, that's not as good as it could be, but the final challenge is this is an insulated basement. If you look under the camper here, you can see a great big plastic panel with all kinds of stuff covered up under it. And if you peek under, what you'll see is that it's full of spray foam. Uh, full of spray foam. 
So that thing is not something that we want to have to open up, cut into, or touch in any way. We don't want to screw with the insulation that's under here, and that's the only way that we would really run wires up front, unless we wanted to do something really exposed, mounting it to the outside of this channel, which I don't want to do with very high amperage 12 volt cabling. I'm not putting welding wire out here in this outside section. That's just not really ideal, and it's not necessary. So yes, we're making a trade-off. We're going to lose a little bit of efficiency from the system, but that's okay because I also have a generator and from time to time when I need to I can hook up the generator. It's big and heavy and noisy and loud and all of the rest of that, but it works, it's okay, and it'll do the job. Now another interesting thing is that I don't really have a lot of space to put my stuff. So if you look at what's behind this wall here, you can see you've got about two feet of cupboard to the outside. Behind this is a little bit of a cavity and there's a cable in there which plugs into the back of this DC converter. That cable is stored in a compartment back there. That compartment sounds like, oh, compartment, great place to put supplies and stuff, but it's about the size of a sewer hose, maybe a little bigger. It's about four by six and about a foot, foot and a half deep. It is not large. And the hatch to it is also not large. So getting access to that is a challenge. What I think I'm going to do, even though it tends to hide stuff when I'm parked, because this slide out is kind of in the way, when we're not parked, this slide out is out. And what that means is that I can put things in this cabinet and they're not in the way of anything. I'll be able to see them on the outside of this. Instead of trying to run wiring under the floor here, and up to the front, which is where, you know, near the standard travel trailer switch panels where a lot of people try to put their solar stuff. Instead of trying to put something there with a long, awkward wire run down over to here, under the floor somehow, and over to the converter, I'm going to put them here in this cabinet. And I have a little hidden panel up here of useless space, which this is sort of, you know, typical travel trailer mode, right? You use the dual use closet. You can decide if you want this for hanging space or to use the shelves. And as you can see, we've chosen to use the shelves. This is our pantry. So for us, this makes a ton of sense to keep as a pantry. And that means up under this panel back here is a perfect mounting place for me to put my monitor, my battery monitor, and my solar charge controller monitor. So I have two displays, one for each. One's going to go here and one's going to go here. And if I need to, I could also install a switch or something like that. And I'm going to take this in three steps. We're going to get solar panels mounted on the roof, up above the back end of this, and get the wiring over to here and down into this cabinet. As soon as I'm able to do that, we're then going to take that wiring and we're going to hook up a solar charge controller to the same 12 volt bus that this DC converter is on. What's really interesting about this is that the wiring diagram has a fusible link, a fuse, both here and by the battery. So that means I have fuse protection for the whole wire run. I don't need to add anything for that. All I have to do is put my piece all of my wiring right behind this thing in the little bit of space that I have and put the displays out here and I should be good to go. If I do get into trouble and I need a little bit more room, there is a little bit of empty space in this panel underneath. It's not completely empty. There's actually a little bit of plumbing in there because the gray water tank is under this side and uh, it has a vent pipe that runs up to the ceiling. Guess how we're getting our wires down, guys? down that vent pipe. Well, not down the pipe, but down the hole that the pipe is running through is a convenient way to get wiring in. So we're going to give that a go and see what it looks like. So I'm going to stop the video here. Uh, we'll talk through the next steps in the next video. Uh, but basically, I have three components that I'm going to be coming in with. And the one thing I will not be doing right away is hooking up 12, or excuse me, 120 volt outlets. And the reason for that is that A, an inverter is pretty expensive. B, I won't have the battery capacity to run a ton of that stuff right away anyway. And C, if you think about it, there's really not a lot of outlets around here. Again, typical travel trailer. There is one small outlet behind the couch, but otherwise, everywhere else through the camper, you can't get power. It just isn't, doesn't exist. The one other place where it tends to be is right under here. Uh, and we don't need the electric kettle for the kitchen for what we're doing and the TV. And the TV, maybe at some point, someday, I might work something out, but I'll tell you, 
the times when we go camping, we tend not to use the TV. The times we're using the TV, we tend to be in an established campground. We're there because we want the full hookup. We want the water in the sewer because we're dewinterizing. We're winterizing. We're camping with the kids and we want the showers. Uh, we're road schooling. We're doing things where we're not necessarily in off-grid mode. If we're in off-grid mode, we're there for a reason. We're hunting and we're not watching TV. We're out there, we're camping and enjoying Moab or some other desert area like uh, uh, Saguaro National Park. Uh, we're not watching TV while we're doing that kind of stuff. So the TV for us, pretty optional. Fireplace, pretty optional. It's a really inefficient way to heat a travel trailer anyway. It's just for ambiance. Um, so for us, putting in an inverter is sort of an expense that we don't need right away because typical travel trailer, all the critical stuff like the fridge, the stove... The furnace, the water pump, and the water heater can all run off of propane. And if we're running those things off propane, there's really no need for the inverter at first. So your typical van setup or your typical motorhome setup is going to be a little different from this. In those setups, you definitely want an inverter. You're going to run a lot more stuff off 120. Uh, maybe you're working remotely. You're working from your van life. Um, that's just not our style of situation. So um, hopefully this will be an interesting video. It'll be kind of a middle ground between some of the other material you see out there. And uh, yeah, let's get started. Okay, before we get started with this installation, let's just take a minute and look through some of the parts we've got here and what some of them are going to be used for. So first of all, hidden behind my storage area here, I have two Renogy 150 watt, excuse me, 160 watt the RNG 160 DBH panels. These are flexible solar panels. They've got a couple of advantages. Now, flexible solar panels don't last as long, we know that, but I'm going to mount them in a way that makes them easily replaceable. But an important detail is that they weigh a fraction of what a full panel costs. Now, in our camper, we have a curved roof. And in a curved roof camper like ours, this is not a walk-on roof. Many campers that are not motorhomes, again, remember, we're, we're somewhere in between what a lot of other installations are like. We're not a van. We're not a motorhome. We do not have a walk-on roof. This roof doesn't have much support up here. So if you push on this, it's just basically a sheet of foam insulation and then a piece of roofing material. So the roof is one long rubber-skinned, um, uh, well, it's actually an elastomeric roof covering. Uh, a problem with that is that that means we don't want to really be mounting super heavy stuff there unless support's been built into it for that. Now, the air conditioner has support. They've got good framing around this piece. But they don't really have framing in some of the other sections. In fact, if you press on the roof outside, it's noticeably soft. So we want some kind of soft mounting system. And what we're going to be doing is using some of these Eternabond tape. So this is a 4-inch wide Eternabond tape. And I also have some die core sealant. And we're going to use that in conjunction with some roofing panels uh, to mount these on the ceiling. Now, I know that some people have done this with twin wall, with polycarb sheets and that seems to work fine i think that's a really good approach but what i found at my local home depot was corrugated plastic roofing the kind you put on sheds and greenhouses and things and i think that's going to give me an extra inch of air ventilation underneath these panels and help them last a lot longer so i don't have a photo of that right now because the material is not here in the camper uh, but i'll show that in one of the upcoming video segments to get the wiring from the panels into the camper, we need some wires. And so I have 30 feet of wiring, and I've got some cable entry glands. Now, I don't need two. I only need one of them because the panels will be daisy-chained together. I'm going to run a 24-volt system. Excuse me, not 24-volt. Uh, it'll be, I think the panels are 19 volts. So it'll be 38 volts coming off the panels. They call it 40, usually, just to save, you know... It's not 357, it's 4 o'clock. But in any event, um, I'm going to run a 40-volt system, so I don't need uh, the cables to be quite as large, but I still did get uh, reasonably large-sized cables to begin with. Um, <clears throat> one nice thing I talked about earlier in the video is that although we have the batteries up front, the battery cabling is 6-gauge. 
and that's rated for the length of this run here for no more than a quarter volt drop at most and by the way you know it should actually be significantly less than that i'm allowing for you know some corrosion and deterioration at the terminals um and it is fused on on the end so i don't have to worry too much about that and that means our solar charge controller will not be as efficient as it could be if it was hooked right in but the thing is, it also means that I don't have to mess around dropping something off the undercarriage trying to run cabling. So my cabling is pretty good, at, it's pretty up to snuff, and as long as I can get things in, I can get things wired. Uh, we're going to be using the EP Ever MPTT or MPPT Tracer uh, Charge Controller. I forgot what this was, the AN30, BN something. Uh, <laughs> I forgot the exact model number of this, but I can put it all uh, in the parts list below if anybody's curious about it. Now, um, this charge controller has one challenge with it, and this is common to all of these. To make them run efficiently, you need a battery temperature sensor. And that's what this is. This is meant to be mounted directly to your batteries, and this cable is then run to this charge controller. Now, if I put the charge controller back here, and if the batteries are all the way up front, past that bed, past the nose cone we saw earlier, that's going to be a challenge. So I need to figure out a way that I can run this wiring. Now they do say, I checked the tech specs, you can extend this. That is okay. Um, however, I still need to run it. Um, so I don't know yet how I'm going to get that cabling out. And that's something that I still need to figure out. So that remains an item to be determined. Also, I'll be installing a battery monitor. Uh, and I have this nice Renogy battery monitor. This is a bi-directional one. You'll notice battery monitors seem to come in two flavors. Super cheap or super expensive. And there doesn't seem to be a $50 option in between. It's either $15 to $20 or it's, you know, $80 to $200. And the main difference is whether or not they're bi-directional. So with the unidirectional ones, the battery monitor will tell you a lot about the charge going into your batteries. And that's useful. And if you only want to spend 20 bucks on a system, that's a good start. But I really felt if I was going to put all this money into a system, I wanted good information on what's going into and out of the battery. And because this is a large, well-established electrical system, I will not be using the load terminals on my charge controller. I am not just running my camper on pure solar. I'm going to be running on shore power, and, you know, I'll be running off the batteries, obviously. I'll run solar when I can. Uh, but a lot of stuff is going to be coming in from other sources than just solar. And in fact, most of the time, you would expect shore power or a generator to be like the bulk of your electrical supply. The solar is here to add boondocking and off-grid time, not to completely go off-grid. I will not have enough capacity to go off-grid for months. If I can go off-grid for seven to nine days for a long hunting trip, that's going to be plenty, and I'm happy to back that up with generator usage during that time uh, on some days to be able to charge up. So, because I won't be using the load terminals in here, and this thing wouldn't really be able to handle my entire house load anyway, um, I won't know from this thing's monitor, which is down here, and I will be installing and using, but I won't know what the actual usage is uh, in the system. I'll only know how well this thing's charging. So, this battery monitor is a pretty important part. And then I have some other miscellaneous things. I've got a couple of, uh, these are just standard wiring uh, jumper blocks. These are uh, just screw terminal blocks that you can put battery cable in. I know it's kind of hard to see under the plastic here, but you can put battery cables in and, and anywhere from uh, 8 to 12 gauge on the other side and kind of make junctions and connections. They've got little nice mounting plates and they're only a few dollars. Uh, so you can see the ones that I got will take a 4 gauge battery cable in and it'll take... Uh, up to four separate 8 or 10 gauge wires on the outside. Now, I will probably not be using the battery terminal side of this, but I will definitely be using it to make connections with these wires. Uh, so that's just a nice little convenience. I can make some connections. I got some extra battery cables here, and the reason I have these is because I have these. So what I went out and bought was two uh, Group 24 deep cycle batteries. These are your standard lead acid, $78 at Walmart, $12 with the core charge batteries. These are not efficient. 
These are not massive lifetime. You can't run these down to zero. You can only run them down to 50%, even though they're deep cycle. And so they're only going to give me, I think they're rated for 101 amp hours, something along those lines. That's kind of what's written across the top here. You can take it with a grain of salt, but it looks like they're about 101 amp hour batteries. So this will give me 200 amp hours, or if you divide that by two, because you can only run them down halfway, give me about 100 amp hours capacity. Now, is that great? No. No, that's not great. Um, I wish I could do more, but with the space that we have, I can only fit a battery box, a twin battery box, that holds two Group 24 batteries. So that's what I've decided to go with for right now. And would Battleborn batteries be better? Yes. Do I have $2,000 to buy two of them? No, I do not. Uh, this entire solar setup, I think, all together with all the parts, including the solar panels, chargers, and everything else, including these two batteries, is only, I think I have $650 in it. I think. Uh, I'll do some math and I'll put some information in the video description once I get all this sorted out. But I do not have that much money and I didn't have that big of a budget. So for me, this was an appropriate choice. I don't mind, again, using a generator, uh, hooking up to shore power. I don't need to be off-grid for 30 days. Um, so I really just needed something to increase my capacity. And the other advantage is that these are brand new batteries. This is a 2012 Sunset Trail. I'm recording this video in 2020. So the battery is original to the camper. Uh, so I have an eight-year-old battery that's seen some use. And I would bet you it has probably lost 30, if not more, of percent of its capacity by now. Uh, so at least replacing the batteries with fresh ones gives me some extra lifetime. And probably what I'll do, just to give myself an extra day or two of margin, is I'll keep that old battery and I'll carry it with me. I'll keep it in my front storage bin, which all campers have. I won't hook it up to anything, but I'll keep it charged and topped off from time to time. But these batteries will not lose their capacity or their their uh, they'll their charge in two months. Uh, they they lose their charge over a year, but they can sit for a month or two without draining way off. And um, just by having that available. Uh, I can add, you know, I can run that out in the middle of the night one night if I start getting desperate and the furnace isn't running and I haven't got any power. So that'll give me a little backup plan. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to take these two solar panels that are sitting here in this back section and mount them to the roof using a turn -a tape. And not twin wall, but a plastic polycarbonate uh, roofing material to act as a standoff and provide some airflow underneath them and to try to help increase the lifetime of the panels. We will run wires from those solar panels in through one of these down to this. <clears throat> and this charge controller will then take over and be hooked into the electrical system using these junction box uh, junction blocks and a little bit more of the cabling over into my DC uh, converter. And the back side of this DC converter has um, terminals already uh, that I can hook into and I will be connecting this to the cables off the back of this DC converter that go out to the battery. From there, once I get this hooked up, I'll be doing my best to figure out how to run the wires from the battery monitor and from the temperature sensor in back to these devices. If I can, my plan is to install everything in this cabinet, provide ventilation in through here, so I'll probably be replacing that with a mesh panel, and then putting the monitors up in this dummy panel. If that doesn't work, coming forward, I have places where cable does run down into a storage compartment. This section here is a storage compartment that leads out to the front. So if I can run cable out through here, I'll be able to hook out. That'll give me a plan B for doing some of my wiring. And uh, yeah, I'll stop the video here and let's see uh, what the next step looks like. Okay, so... <clears throat> Let's take a minute and talk about some of the issues we need to address here with this system. Again, we're not dealing with a bus or van conversion, and we're not dealing with a classic motorhome. Uh, and we have a couple of things that we need to deal with, and a lot of that's going to come down to which voltage something runs on. So, you know, just like many setups, there's a provision for shore power. 
but in a travel trailer, that's the main expected power input. You're expected to use that the bulk of the time, and you're expected to run purely off battery the rest of the time. There's never any in between. And so what they've done is they've said, listen, you're shore power. You could be plugging this into a wall outlet or a generator where a motorhome would have a generator built in. And because of that, they have a lot of appliances that are set up to run off 120 volt. In something like this, they actually have very few things on the 120 volt circuits. A few important things, but very few. So this is external. It's meant to be a generator or shore power. And this is a 120 volt 30 amp feed. That comes into a DC converter, and the converter has two power banks. One of them is 120, and one of them is 12. There are fuses on the 12 volt circuits, and there are breakers on the 120 volt circuits. And what they do is kind of interesting. They say, listen, we're gonna do everything that's super high power, but also kind of optional on the 120 volt circuits. Those are your outlets, so charging uh, your television, uh, we in this camper, although many don't, we have things like a, um, an electric fireplace, some stuff like that, and the air conditioner. So the air conditioner is a big high draw device, uh, but a lot of it's outlets, TV, things like that. Everything else runs off 12 volt. So that's your water pump, which is important for getting, you know, your plumbing, your shower, all that stuff working. Uh, your fridge is 12 volt plus propane. So there's a little bit of 12 volt going into it to kind of run the igniter and stuff like that. And the rest of it is propane powered. Your furnace is propane and 12 volt battery powered. The 12 volt is running the fan and the propane is providing the heat. Your water pump, all your internal lighting, 100% of your internal lighting is all 12 volt. And some miscellaneous things, exhaust fans, uh, the radio, just some little stuff you could totally live without, but it's kind of nice to know that's all 12 volt. Um, but what's interesting about a, a trailer like this is that they don't make many provisions to cross that divide. And the reason is this converter. So in a lot of setups, what you'll see is somebody wants to hook an inverter up. They want to be able to run a lot of 120 volt stuff. This could be your laptop, your TV, maybe a small air conditioner, some chest freezers for people doing van conversions. There's a lot of stuff that runs on 120 volt. We don't need any of that. They've made it optional for us, but in making it optional, they also made it really difficult to change your mind. And the reason for that is that there's no provision for an inverter in this setup. You can't hook an inverter straight to your solar and battery system, which is on 12 volt, and then put the inverter out to your 120 volt circuits for two reasons. First, you would backfeed this, which is not only very dangerous, but also illegal and dangerous and also it's very dangerous did i mention that it's very dangerous you never want to backfeed here now there's an easy solution for that you can get it's basically a relay that'll cut this off when you know you're powering on one side or the other and some of them are even automatic so that's fine it's about eighty dollars but it's not a big deal great safety measure if you want to do that but the bigger problem is the converter itself <clears throat> you really can't shut it off like it doesn't have a mechanism for doing that I know some people pull fuses, and there are some things you can kind of do as hacky workarounds, but it's not like it has a power switch. So you can't shut it on and off, and it's not controllable. It doesn't have an input to say, I want you to do this or I don't. So what this thing is trying to do 100% of the time is take the 120 volts and bring it down to 12. And that's because you want your shore power running all your systems and charging your battery at the same time. They don't mean for you to be running solar. They mean for you to be plugged in. And then you go boondock, you live a couple of days, you drain your batteries, and you go find a COA, get a full hookup, and charge back up. If we want to put an inverter in here, we basically have two options. We can completely take the converter out of the equation, but it's a really big, very convenient piece of equipment that's already wired in, and it's kind of crazy to do that. Or we can run separate circuits off an inverter. So we can say, okay, well, maybe what I'll do is I just won't have the converter having its 120 volt breakers out. Maybe what I'll do is have a separate set of 120 volt breakers. But now I'm rewiring my camper. And I don't really want to do that. And I don't really need to do that because I don't care about the air conditioning. I don't need the TV and I don't need the outlets. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to take the outlets and put some additional 12 volt outlets throughout the camper. 
So I'm going to add 12 volt cigarette lighter plugs in some of the spots where there's 120 volt outlets today. Why would I do that? Well, because most of our devices now are charged with USB-C. And USB-C cigarette lighter chargers are actually not only very cost effective, they're small and they're very efficient. They're, they use the power really well. Because they're not stepping down, they don't have to do as much work, so they work really well. Our laptops, all of our cell phones, our other battery-powered devices, things like drone charging, and just stuff like that, all can run off just a few extra outlets. So I'm going to run one into the bedroom, I'm going to run one over here by the couch and the dinette area, and probably one in the back bedroom, and that'll be enough for us to charge up. So all I have to do then is say, well, is there anything else I still want off 120? Well, I don't care about the electric fireplace, and I can live without the air conditioning. The one thing that would really be nice is the TV. And it's funny to say, because when we go camping, we typically don't use it. When we go camping. But we use our camper for more than just camping. It's more than just going back country and appreciating the Rocky Mountains. For us, it's also a way that we travel. It's a way that we move around and get around, and we use it to work and to live in during times when we're traveling. So you can have a lot of romanticism about camping, but there are times when it is nice to be able to turn the TV on, watch the news, watch a movie, or do something like that. Now here's the interesting thing. The TV is only 40 watts. The air conditioner is 1350. I looked it up before I came out here. And the outlets are whatever you draw out of them. If you plug in a hairdryer, if you plug in an electric kettle, we have all those things, but they're totally optional. We have other kettles, and we don't need to use the electric one when we're off-grid. So we don't need the air conditioner, and that's a big draw. And the only other thing that we really want is the TV. And it turns out it's a very low power draw. It is so low that I don't need a big inverter centrally installed with a lot of 120-volt circuits. I can do one right where the TV is installed. They make, and I don't have here on the table, but I'm, it's on order. We know we're all fighting COVID madness, so shipping is slow. But they make inverters that are very small. They're designed to be plugged into a cigarette lighter, and they put out about 100 watts, and not very reliably. 80 is probably a reasonable limit. You want to derate them a little bit. Um, but for a 40-watt TV, that's more than enough, and they're very small and very easy to hide. So since I already have 12 volt to that location, I can just tap off of that, run a very small inverter to run the TV, and I'm done. So that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to install two solar panels here. These will be up on the roof of the camper. We will take these and run them down to a charge controller. So this is a solar panel, this is a solar panel, this is a charge controller. The charge controller will come down to our 12 volt circuit. Here. And nothing else has to change. Now, in my case, and not everybody has to do this, but I've decided to also install a second battery. I have just a little bit of room in here, and so I will tap off the batteries like this. And I'm sorry the drawing got a little bit messy, but I'm not really doing too much in here. There are a few other components, like I have the battery monitor, which has a shunt, and I'm going to put that, obviously, in this battery feed line, probably right around there. It has to go on the negative side. There's a negative side shunt. And that's so it can get bidirectional sensing. Oh, well, it's part of the reason. Um, but it's designed to be a negative shunt. So I'll put it on the negative terminal of the battery. And I have, you know, a couple of monitors for my uh, charge controller. It has a, you know, an externally mounted display, which will get mounted. So my, my battery monitor and my charge controller monitor will both go in some central location, you know, to the extent that I have wire to actually let it reach or can extend. Um, and I'll figure that out. Uh, but all I have to do for the TV is add a small point of, of use inverter. I have 12 volt in that vicinity already. And then, uh, whoops, we've lost our, our video here. Sorry, we're running without a tripod right now at the moment. And I'm basically done. So um, 
you know, <laughs> uh, the best plans don't survive the first day of war, uh, and we'll have to see. I'm sure I'll deal with some issues, and I'll have to resolve some problems. But by and large, I think I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm not going to be installing an inverter. I think I don't need one. That simplifies the entire system. It cuts a bunch of components out, and it cuts a bunch of risk out. There's a bunch of stuff that I don't have to do uh, by not installing an inverter that I can get away with because I am in a camper that was never designed for any of this, but because of that, you are kind of forced to keep it simple. Unless you want to do a lot of rewiring, you have to keep this simple. And in that case, that's an advantage. Alright, so I'm sorry this video is going to be pretty low quality here. I am kind of cramped in a corner and I've got the DC converter pulled out so we can take a look at what's going on inside it. And as you can see, there's a 12 volt power bank over here with a set of fuses. And each fuse has a little LED indicator to help you tell when it's blown. Real handy instead of having to pull out every fuse. Over here we've got a set of breakers. And there's actually room in here for two more on this bus bar. Uh, but I won't be installing any breakers. I'm not adding any circuits here on the 120 volt side. You can see all the 120 volt wiring looks a lot like a home electrical panel in that they've got these bonding bars, uh, these bus bars over here for grounds and for the the negatives, the returns, and then all of the live circuits here. You can see they've got tapped off onto these breakers. Now we're not going to be touching anything on this side. Um, I am completely unhooked right now. Nothing's live, so everything's pretty safe here. Uh, and I'm not connected to shore power, but you know, in any event, we're, we're staying well away from this side for the most part anyways. Uh, over here on the 12 volt side, you can see there's a big fat white wire and a big fat black wire. Well, guess what? Looking at the back, this black and white wire, these go straight out to the battery. So this is six gauge battery cable and it runs straight up to the battery. And that means all I have to do is tap into this. Now, a little complication. So a nice piece is that they've got uh, some small bus bars here for those things. So you can see here's our positive terminal running out to the battery. And here's our negative terminal going out to the battery. The only thing is the negative terminal has something on the other side of the bus bar. The positive has room. I could put a wire directly into this. There's only a wire on one side. But the negative is full, and I don't want to double up wires in there. So I am going to be unhooking one of these negative wires and, um, and moving this over to another bus bar that I am installing, and I'll be adding to this setup. So out of the back side here, the battery cabling is already done, and this charge converter, this DC converter, is already charging the battery through this cable just fine, so adding solar charger to this is not going to cause any trouble. You can see where the shore power comes in, that's this big flat wire on the top, and then they've got some extra uh, wires that run out to the 120 volt circuits. So again, I could move these over to an inverter if I wanted to, and then use a transfer switch to avoid back feeding, uh, but in my case, I just really don't need to. The wiring is a hot mess. You can see this is pretty typical for an RV. You know, people just kind of whack holes with sawzalls and do whatever if it's out of sight, out of mind, right? So uh, great quality. This Sunset Trail, uh, you know, Crossroads, uh, thanks guys. I uh, could at least have a little pride in your work here, but it works fine. Uh, the cables kind of all are tied together and they are, you know, tied off at various spots so that they're well supported. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, and you can see one thing I'm not super thrilled with is that there is an awful lot of water uh, piping through here. So this water pipe here goes down to an outside shower and then also uh, down through the floor here. I don't know if this is going to be visible down through a big hole in the floor. There we go. And uh, you can see the, the blue and red PEX piping. And um, 
This is a waterline feed to an outside shower, which is plumbed right behind the electrical panel. So God forbid you ever have a leak, you're spraying water all over your electrical supplies. Not really my favorite design in the world, but uh, that's what we have. So what we'll be doing here is uh, installing the charge converter, excuse me, the, uh, the solar uh, MPTT controller. Um, down here on the bottom of this cabinet, probably over here on this side, where it's kind of out of the way, mounted to that wall. And you can see there's an access panel on the bottom. Now that access panel is normally covered with this piece of wood, and I'm just going to be replacing that with a piece of mesh panel, uh, some mesh screening, uh, to allow some ventilation. Uh, and then I'll be tying that up into my 12-volt supply over here, and uh, the rest of the wiring will follow out of that. We'll also be adding a couple of... Uh, cigarette lighter plugs over here in the dinette area and over in the couch area. Um, probably one in the back bedroom, which is right behind this wall, so it's easy to wire into. And one in the front bedroom. I haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, so running wires is going to be a little interesting, uh, but at least from right here, several of the plugs I can kind of just pop through the walls one side or the other and be in these two spots, and that should be in pretty good shape. So let's get started. All right, with the solar panels mounted on the roof, and I may need to edit this video to get the ordering of things right because I've actually already got them up there. Um, but now that the solar panels are up and the charge controller is installed, uh, what I need to do now is get my second battery set up here. So you can see I've got one battery box and there is room on the rail for another battery. I've got the propane tanks removed. I think it's just a good idea not to be working around any kind of spark, <laughs> potential spark when you've got propane tanks sitting here. So got the propane tank safely off to the side and that gives me more room. You can see not only does my rail have room for more space on one side, but also the battery box is not full. And that's because this is a group 27 battery box. This is a group 24 battery. If you're not familiar with the group naming, that's not a problem. You don't really need to memorize. All you need to know is what size fits what. If you've got a group 27 battery box, you can fit anything smaller up to group 27. You couldn't fit a group 30 in there. The group is basically a standard dimension. So I've got a group 24 battery here. I have another one inside and I have a dual group 24 battery box. So I'm going to take this one off, the old one off, and I'm going to put the new one on right here. Now, before I do, I wanted to just show a close-up of this battery terminal. This is in really terrible shape. Now, it looks really ugly because this connector here has a little bit of electrical tape on it as well. That electrical tape is not necessary. If you have a gas-type fitting and you're putting electrical tape on it, all you're doing is encouraging one more place for moisture to build up. And actually, this ends up being one of those examples of when you've got somebody that's stupid. When somebody's installing something and they don't know what they're doing, you'll often see this, where they add electrical tape in a place where it's not necessary. These crimp style fittings, properly crimped, are gas tight. Gas tight means oxygen can't get in there and corrode anything. They are not watertight. <laughs> They're not waterproof. And so if you put electrical tape on there and there's any kind of moisture, which could be just condensation from a snowstorm or rain, it doesn't have to be pouring in your battery box. Just moisture in the air can collect in here and it can get inside that electrical tape and corrode things. Now, this fitting is not in terrible shape, but I am going to clean this up. You can see there is some corrosion here on the ring terminal. And it's always a good idea to clean these things up before you go installing something new because otherwise you're just giving up efficiency in the system. And that's just a waste. All right, here I've got the installation completed. I've got everything hooked back up to the ship power. And I know that I've got good power because I can access all of my devices. Like, I don't know if this will show up here, but... So i got 12-volt power running into the trailer. So what we've got is two batteries running in parallel. This is a really good time to check your terminals or you get a nice big shower of sparks when you hook it up. Make sure you go negative to negative, positive to positive. In this case, we're running our two batteries in parallel so we get more uh, storage capacity out of them, not more voltage. Um, Obviously, in this type of situation, we're going to have to stay with 12 volts because that's what everything inside is expecting. We don't want to fry anything. So here we've got two 12-volt, 100-amp-hour deep-cycle batteries, so a total of 200 amp-hours, or divide it right back by two if you think you're only going to run your batteries down 50%. I have a Renergy battery monitor with shunt installed, and you can see it is correctly picking up uh, that we've got 12.4 volts in our batteries. We've been running for about a half an hour here. So 
um, yeah, we should be in pretty good shape. I'm going to close everything up. I kind of just left it open so you could see it. And one thing I may do is uh, I may not run this Renogy battery monitor all the way out to the back panel just because it is a little inconvenient to try to get it there. I may try to put it somewhere a little closer. It does come with a little bit of cord, uh, but you can see it's only about 10 feet, maybe uh, maybe 12 feet of cord here. So um, I won't be able to get it all the way back to where the solar charger is, uh, but it, at least it'll let me uh, mount it somewhere inside, and if I can figure out where I have a hole to get in there, um, I can get some of this wiring done. So just to talk about the battery monitor and what it's doing, this is the more expensive of the battery monitors, but even so, its functionality is pretty limited. It can show you a little bit of information about what's going on and about what some of the usage is. I've just programmed it now, so although my batteries are not actually at 100%, I can always reset this later. I went ahead and said that they were at 100 And now uh, I've also told it that I have 200 amp hours of battery capacity here. And now it's telling me that I'm at 100%. My batteries are at 12.4 volts, so obviously they're not actually 100%, but we just told it that it was. But the important thing is, you can see my draw. It's drawing a watt right now, 160 milliamps. And that means that I've got some things inside there that are consuming power. Now, we could go around and hit all the breakers and figure out what they are, but we actually know what some of those are. There are a lot of things that have idle standby, and uh, some of those are plugged in, and they're drawing on the battery. So you can see... It says, look, I'm, I'm pretty good for 99 hours here, but, you know, 99 hours isn't that long. Now, none of this is accurate. We need to program this and get it all tuned up. So it's actually considerably longer than 99 hours. But if you've ever wondered why your battery drains down while you're in storage, it's this. You do actually have parasitic drains inside your trailer pretty much at all times unless you're very, very careful to, you know, unplug and disconnect basically everything there is. All right, here we are back again. What's changed? Well, if you notice, we're down to only 70 milliamps of draw here. Yeah, fluctuating, but in any case, around 70, 75 milliamps of draw. Before, we were at 160. That's a massive difference. What did I unplug? Well, there's a radio inside, and the radio has a standby mode. Even when the radio is not on, it's drawing some power. Uh, it has one of those, you know, digital on-off things. And you can see it's got a clock running and all the rest of that. And that was drawing 60 milliwatts. And the other 100 was from the appliances. So the appliances have sort of a standby mode as well. And when I pulled the fuse for the appliances, we went down to 0.07. And I would say the 0.07 is probably just whatever's left over in the DC converter. So here we are. We've got a dry ship now. And we're ready to get the solar hooked up. All right. And here we have the completion of our journey. I've got the... Uh, charge control, the solar charge controller kind of buried back in the panel there. That is not its permanent place. I'm going to mount it to the sidewall over here so there's plenty of airflow. And I've got a, a stud back there that I can get a good solid mount for. But I have the solar coming into it. You can just barely see the solar wires coming in. I have the battery charge wires coming out. I do not have any load wires coming because, of course, the charge controller, the DC converter, is going to be doing that. The red lights are on because I have a few fuses out. This is one of those units that will illuminate a, uh, an LED to tell you which fuse is blown. And it's kind of a clever trick the way they do that, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, so I have a few fuses out on the floor while I was making sure I had almost no house load at all. Whenever you're hooking up an electrical system, the less load you can have in the system when you plug things in, the less trouble you're going to have. You aren't going to have sparks. Uh, you're not going to have any exciting, uh, hair-raising moments when you hook everything up. And some of these components are, are able to detect when you've got something reverse wired, but still it can get exciting if you've got a uh, draw on the system when you first hook things in. So I got my, my system draw down to about zero by pulling those fuses, and I'll be reinstalling them shortly. But we can see the effect. I've got a happy face on my... my um, my charge controller monitor and uh, yeah we're looking like we're in pretty good shape here I've got 36.3 volts coming in from the panels those are those two um, Renogy 150 watt panels and you can see that it is putting uh, 15 and a half amps out to my battery which is just fantastic so excited about that uh, and uh, right now, the only negative is that I do not have the battery temperature sensor hooked up. The wiring here is too long to be able to do that, so I need to figure out a way to get some wiring from the back here up to the front, and I will figure that out at some point.